Good morning, everybody. Welcome to God's house this morning. It's so good to see you. Would you stand to your feet with us? We're going to worship together this morning. You guys know we serve a big God. Amen. Worthy of our praise. Come on. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. We've already won. There's no weapon. There is no That is heaven left its mark on you. There is no worry with the power to conquer truth. Before we at the speed of life and in his kingdom every dead thing is bound to rise Now all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith He will crush disappointment and break every chain Oh, all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith He will crush disappointment all of my fear I will turn into pray Shake off the spirit as I sing out your name A victory dance I will dance out in faith He will crush this
love that song. That song says, bless God in the sanctuary, bless God in the fields of plenty, bless God in the darkest valley. Translation, I'll bless God when I'm at church and I feel like it. 
I'll bless God when everything's going up in life, and I'll bless God when things aren't going so well because he's always worthy of my praise. That's what it means. It reminds me of, of David. David says, bless the Lord at all times. Everybody say, at all times. At all times. Ooh, y'all sound good today. One more time, at all times. At all times. I started thinking about that phrase, at all times, and I was like, you know, I've heard that phrase before. Here at a lot of places. You ever been to an amusement park? Sit down. Please keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle at. You've been to an amusement park. Okay. Uh, you ever seen one of those signs that OSHA puts up for fire hazards? It says, please keep this space clear at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked in a warehouse for like three weeks before they fired me. And I wasn't very good at it. Okay. It's not funny. I worked there. And back with the machinery, there was this sign and it said, employees must keep their helmet on at all times. You get it. See, I started thinking about that at all times and I realized people tell us to do something at all times, normally because it keeps us safe, keeps us out of danger. And I just want to submit to you really quick. I think that we're called to bless the Lord at all times because it keeps us safe and out of danger. L let me explain. Okay. See, I think when life is going up, woo, and we're good, I think we still bless the Lord at all times. Why? To keep us humble. Because we know even when life is going up, oh man, but it's God who put the strength in my bones. It's God who put the breath in my lungs. I'm not going to get a big head about it. It's God's world. I'm just blessed to be living in it, right? It keeps us humble. But when we bless the Lord in the low times, it doesn't keep us humble. It keeps us hopeful. See, we might be in a dark valley, but we say, hold on, hold on. I'm not walking through this alone. I might be confused, but I'm blessing God because he's not confused. I might feel weak, but I'm blessing God because the word says in my weakness, that is when he is made strong. See, we bless the Lord at all times in the highs and the lows because it keeps us safe. See, when it's high, woo, and we bless the Lord, it keeps us from the danger of becoming conceited. But when it's low and it's hard and we bless him, it keeps us from the danger of being crushed. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you're in a high time or a low time, but I do know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to bless the Lord at all times. So we're going to have a little fun. We're going to have a little fun. Okay. We're going to practice for you that are in a good time. Maybe it'll be easier for you, for you than a bad time. It might take more, more, uh, strength. But we're going to read Psalm 34, 1 through 3, and it ends by saying, let us exalt the Lord together. And here's my challenge, okay? When I say let us exalt the Lord together, we're really going to think about everything that's going through our mind and in our life. And we're going to say, regardless, I'm going to choose to bless God right now. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Psalm 34, 1 through 3. I will praise the Lord at all times. There it is. One more time. At all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Come on, praise him this morning. Because he's good, because he's faithful, because he hasn't taken his hand off you, because he knows exactly where you are and he's not leaving. There, I will bless the Lord at all times. Woo, I love being in church. All right. Now, with that said, we're ready to celebrate baptisms. We're going to see some people make a public declaration. But before that, we're going to see a little video of my man, Stephen. I learned between services, they call you Slewy. Slewy. My boy, Slewy. He's awesome. But it's a video of how he learned to bless the Lord at all times. Check this out. Four years ago, I was given a death sentence. I was very sick. Doctors found out that I had cirrhosis of the liver and I was almost sent home on hospice. I turned to alcohol because I didn't want to face my problems. And before I knew it, I was drowning my alcohol addictions and it was certain that I needed help or I was gonna die. I never followed God, never really gave my life over to God. But a close friend of mine, as we were talking, told me about Faith Family. And the moment that I walked through those doors, man, I felt that I was at home. 
I knew this is where I wanted to give my life to God. In my profession, I am literally surrounded by death, and I see a lot of sad and painful things. It was time that I turned to something that could give me life. So on November 26th, I decided I was gonna let God in. And when I did, it felt amazing. I felt free. And then I heard about water baptism. And honestly, before I, I didn't know what it meant for my life. But when I understood what his word says about being raised to life, I knew that's what I wanted. He set me free. He redeemed me. And now I live. Awesome things in our lives, and he's going to continue to do so. We have 30 people up in the baptistry today. Amen. Uh, and I'm starting with my friend Miss Evelyn. Listen, she's got a story, but what we all know up here is that we don't deserve God's love, but he loves us anyways, and we're going to give our lives to him because of it. Amen. And so uh, we're celebrating today. We're not just celebrating uh, God's heart in our and our, what God's done in our lives. But it is Evelyn's 19th birthday today. Happy birthday, Evelyn. The whole church says happy birthday, just so you know. Uh, but we're going to baptize. We've got families, friends up here uh, saying, man, I'm making this proclamation of faith for God's glory. Amen. So, Evelyn, you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? All right, girl. Upon your profession of faith, it's my great honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
children then you hear your children now you are the same God you are the same God you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are come on do you believe it this morning you were proud Provided. You are the Savior. You are the Savior. You moved in power. God moved in power now. You are the Savior. You are the Savior. You were a healer. You were a healer. You are a healer now. You are the Just as the stone that was thrown at the tomb in the 
shout of praise. Come on, once we were dead in our sin, but Jesus Christ has raised us to new life. Is that your story this morning? Is that your truth this morning? Come on, give him another shout of praise. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way. Man, are you glad to be in his house this morning? Me too. Man, can you feel God is doing a new thing among us, church family? Do you receive it today? Amen. Well, hey, we're not done yet. We've got a whole lot more church to do. But junior high students, you guys are dismissed to your service. And the rest of you, before you're seated, there is somebody really amazing standing all around you. I want you to turn to your left, to your right, your front, your back. Learn their names, say good morning, and we'll continue on. Well, good morning, church family. Who's excited to be in God's house this morning? Isn't this a special place to be? I just love being here with each and every single one of you this Sunday morning. It's great. We have an awesome service ahead. But before we continue on, we always like to take just a few minutes and welcome those who may be here for your very first time, or maybe you've been coming for a little bit, but you're still a little new. We just want to say welcome to you. We're so, so excited that you're here. We're honored that you've taken time out of your week to come and be with us, to serve and worship God. So we're just so thankful that you're here today. You know, wherever you've Wherever your journey has taken you in life, we're glad that you're here. FFC wants to be a place where we just meet you right where you're at in any season, in any stage of life. So we just want to be here for you. You know, it's our mission and our goal here at Faith Family Church to help people win. We are committed to seeing people win in life, win in their journey with Jesus. So we want to make sure you know that we're here for you, that you're important to us. We want you to know that we're in your corner, and we would love just to get to know you and learn how we can be a blessing to you, learn how we can serve you in the best way possible. So that's why we've created one of those orange cards that you'll see right there in the seat backs in front of you today. If you would take a few seconds and fill that out for us, you can drop it in the box as you leave, or you can follow the link here on the screen, or you can scan that little QR code right there in the seat backs as well. It takes you to the same thing. And this is just a way for our team here to get to know you. And like I said, learn how we can be a blessing to you. We just want to learn how we can be a blessing to you and serve you. And we would also just love to get to know you. And if you are here for your first time today, we have a welcome hub. Everyone say welcome hub. Our welcome hub is located through these doors right here. We've got a great team of people back there who would love to meet you. They'll give you a tour of the building. They'll answer any questions you may have, give you any kind of information on connect groups, dream teams, anything like that. And they also have a cool gift for you. So make sure you stop by back there today after service. So church family, let's tell our new guests how excited we are that they're here with us this morning. It started with a plan to resource those doing important things who really need help. It birthed a vision to partner in seeing families resourced, children rescued, the enslaved redeemed, pastors empowered, and church plants mobilized. It continues as a dream to not let anyone anywhere live their lives without being touched by the reality of who Jesus Christ is. God invites us to make an impact together with Him. Well, good morning, Faith family. Great to worship with you. Did you see Pastor Jim's uh, bright red hair in that picture? (laughs) It's turned darker through the years, but it hadn't turned loose, and that's a good thing, right? (laughs) He's still got it. (laughs) Hey, it's so great to worship with you. Isn't it awesome that we can dream together about doing, doing something more for God? Amen. Everybody say more. We're believing for more in 24. And, of course, our legacy magazines are available. Those are projects that we feel like God has led us to give toward as a church, locally, uh, nationally, and internationally. So those are available for you. We also have this year a guide, a legacy guide, which is real easy. How many of you like the short versions of things? That's what this is. And you could just fold it up, put it in your Bible, pray over it. But that's available as well. And Faith Family, I just want to thank you for being so generous and making a difference with the life that you're living now. I'll tell you, Jesus talks about, Peter talked about uh, looking forward to the day of the Lord and speeding its coming. I mean, you know, we can help God, God get his do- work done quick and we can see more people 
across the borders of our country reached uh, for heaven. And so we're thankful for that. He talks to us about not just building bigger barns, but staying rich toward God. How many of you want to stay rich toward God? Amen. You want, you want to have something in heaven when you get there. But we're talking, as we receive our, our tithes and offerings, we're talking about uh, money milestones, things that will, that will help us because God calls us. Money is one of the years God calls us to manage well, to steward well. So we're going to go over our uh, four money uh, milestones. Number one, understand and embrace God's purpose for my giving, spiritual maturity, and impact for God. Those are the two things. Milestone number two, save 1500 for a minor emergency. Number three, uh, pay off all debt except your mortgage. And number four, max out your 401k or whatever retirement plan that you have. How many of you know it is wise to say, save for the future? Everybody say wise. Listen to this scripture. The Bible says the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. And, you know, having a 401k retirement plan just enables us to earn money and, and earn interest on the money that we have and, and it not be taxed. How many of you know it's, not, it's a good thing when our money is not taxed, right? We take it out, we got we to pay taxes on it, but if we keep it in there, and I don't know about you, but... You know, I, David said, I was, one, I was once young, and now I am older. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, you, you think when you put that money in when you're young that, you know, it's going to be forever before you get it out. But have you know, it comes quicker than we think, right? And so it's just so good to save for the future. Pastor Jim has always been a, the money manager in our house. He's a lot better with numbers than I am. It's a good thing. He's always saved well. He's invested well for us. And I appreciate that because it creates a peace for me. It creates security, right, for our future when things are in order like that. Um, you know, when we got married 38 years ago, uh, we, we were debt-free, but we also didn't have any money, right? <laughs> so, but it was good that we were debt-free. But we started right away the 10-10-80 plan, and that's where we give God 10%, our first 10%, we save 10%, and then we live off the rest of the 80%. And so, you know, it's always worked for us. It's just little by little. How many of you know you can save if you'll just do it little by little? And so over the, over the years, it's been a real blessing for us. Of course, his parents passed away at 25, and later on, he got an inheritance from them. We put the first part down on our house that we built 30 years ago, we're still in that house, and then the rest we put in savings. But, you know, God says this to us, and I think it's such an interesting scripture. He says, to him who has, more will be given. But even those who don't have what he has will be taken away. And, and so, but part of that scripture, so that's talking about stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. If we're good with what he's given us, then he'll add to us. Not just add. He said he'll give us an abundance. God wants us blessed abundantly. Not just personally, but he wants us to be, to be blessed so we can be a blessing to our world. So, Faith Family, thank you for being such a blessing to this region, to the world, through your gifts, through being faithful, consistent, generous in, your, in, in giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure to God. How many of you believe we're going to do more in 24? Amen. Let's prepare to give today. If you have your gift, why don't you just lay your hand on it, whether it's your phone or your envelope, let's pray over it. God, we're so grateful for how you are at work for the good in our lives. Lord, you're a good father. You want to bless us abundantly. You want to, Lord, bless us so that we can be a blessing to our world. And God, I just thank you for the generosity of Faith Family Church. God, how they give, Lord, of their service, their prayers, their resources to you so your work continues to move forward. God, we're blessed. You said you will honor those who honor you, and we want to do that well, Father. Thank you. We give gratefully. We give with happy hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello there. Isn't life beautiful? Unfortunately for Johnny in California, it's been kind of tough. Johnny writes, Dear TV Dad, my son has not slept through the night for three years. 
my wife and I are exhausted. What do we do? Well, Johnny, sometimes you just need to take a step back. You know, these days won't last forever. In fact, someday you may even miss them. Thanks, TV Dad. <laughs> you bet. Hey, well, folks, join us for Family Matters, a new series starting February 4th. Inspired Women's Conference is a girls' weekend for women of every age, stage, and season of life with powerful worship, inspiring Bible teaching, delicious food, an annual after party, and so much more. This year, we'll also welcome guest speaker, Lisa Harper. Girls, save the date for Inspired Women's Conference 2024. Chris and Brandy Garcia here with news on Marriage Weekend 2024. This weekend exists to help people experience God's satisfying and significant design for marriage. And this year is no different. Friday, February 9th, we'll kick off with a night to dress up, visit the photo booth, create special moments, and capture meaningful memories. We'll also hear from guest speakers, pastors, and professional counselors, Brett and Janice Sharp. Saturday, we'll bring more fun and a marriage workshop with our guest speakers. The Sharps hold a rare and valuable perspective on the role of both theology and psychology psychology in marriage. They have helped thousands of people build strong marriages in their three plus decades of service. That's right. Don't miss this opportunity to invest in your marriage, your family, and future. Find details or register for Marriage Weekend 2024 at myffc.com slash events. I've been a part of the Experiencing God small group for 12 weeks. I decided to join this group because I had spent many, many years very, very busy. And um, I just felt like it was time for me to do something for myself, something that could help me connect to God, to grow my faith. I had done similar things in the past and I just missed it. I was ready to reconnect with others and grow deeper with God again in a more intentional way. I've really, really enjoyed being a part of this group. It has helped my faith grow, watching the other people grow in their faith. And as we get together and we talk about the week that we had and how we listened to the Holy Spirit and the, the chances that we took, it really helps me to remember throughout the chaos of life that, that God is still there. He's still speaking to me personally. He's giving me instructions. He's using me to touch other people's lives. If you're thinking about joining a connect group, do not hesitate. I promise you won't regret it. Well, good morning, everybody. You doing good? Yes, sir. Hey, do me a favor. Just take a deep breath. Would you do that? Breathe in, breathe. Don't worry, nobody's going to have a baby in the sanctuary today. Remember that? Breathe in, breathe out. But I want you to know that I realize we're a little slower today in service. But believe it or not, I'm going to have you out of here at 1220 today. Somebody say, I'll believe it when I see it. Okay, now if God does something so amazing, none of us would want to leave, then I'll, you can stay here with me. But my father-in-law taught me there are three rules to good preaching. Number one, you stand up so they can see you. Number two, you speak up so they can hear you. Number three, you shut up so they love you. Those are three pretty good rules, aren't they? And uh, I promise you, it's, it's harder work to preach short and good than long and bad. I promise you. And uh, I'm so excited about our message today. Before we get into it, can we give a big hand to all those who were baptized this morning? Yeah. Man, it brings such excitement to my heart. And I want to encourage all of you who were baptized that when you went under the water, that's a sign of the great mercy of God. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, but he wants to do something beautiful. We, we can always know that God wants to be at his best when we're at our worst. Lamentations 3 says, the love of God will never fail us. It's new every morning. So you can always know God's mercy is going to be there for you. The other thing we know is that God's grace takes us places we could never go without him. It's why it's called all-surpassing grace. He'll take you places you could, never, you could never reach if you didn't honor him well in your heart. So we just want to thank all of you for that. And real quickly, let me just say this, and then we'll pray and get into God's word. Uh, you've probably noticed on the back of your sermon outlines, we always have three questions at the end. And they are, what did the Holy Spirit say to you? What are you going to do about it? And how can I pray for you? How can I help you? Those questions are designed to help families experience the work of God strong together. 
They're designed to help friends experience the work of God strong together. And we're called to support each other and to strengthen each other. And when we do, we can end up rejoicing a lot and yelling a little in our home. Come on, somebody, that's a good thing, right? And so let me just encourage you in those questions. Then also let me encourage you that today is Connect Group Sunday. So excited about Connect Group Sunday. We have groups that will help you mature in your Bible knowledge and the Bible promises wherever there's maturity there's going to be victory in our lives you can learn uh, how to get through seasons of grief into what God's dreaming about how to make it through difficult times and have God do something amazing you can be part of groups that do things that matter to your heart but in the midst of it we make great friendships and uh, that's that's often the best part amen so okay let's pray together Lord we thank you for your word And God, we thank you for how it blesses us. But Lord, today we're going to study how, Lord, it can bless us even more if we'll learn how to get it down into our homes, get it down into the people we care for. So Lord, we pray today that God will hear you well and we set our hearts to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. All of us look around at times and our heart's broken. And it's because we see people who love their kids and love the next generation, but it seems like they can't quite get things together and they just can't get the help that they need. As a matter of fact, sometimes we see people and they really want to do so much, but it seems like they're so busy and if they're not careful, they're going to not, you know, keep going at it like they should. I want to start this morning with a great quote I I read years ago by J. Oswald Saunders, And he said, the best leaders are those who know the way, who go the way, and then who show others the way. And I remember reading that and thinking, I know a lot of leaders who know the way, and I know a lot of leaders who go the way because I've been privileged to be around a lot of high-achieving people in my life. But it's a rare person who really slows down his life, and he shows other people the way, and because of that, there's multiplied success all around that person. It makes me think of a story I heard about an old farmer and all the dogs on his farm were really mangy. And these dogs used to protect his herd and they would get the herd in the barn when there was a storm. And they would protect, you know, the the animals from rats and mice that would come into the barn as well. One day his friend saw it and he said, man, how much do you spend on dog food? Trying to help him a little bit. And the farmer answered, he said, oh, I don't spend anything on dog food. He said, my philosophy is if the dogs are hungry enough they'll find it somewhere on the farm and some of the dogs probably will but here's the problem with that not every dog is going to be blessed like they should in that kind of an environment and then also there's not going to be the bond that forms between the farmer and his dogs that God created us to experience and that's why God wants us to know how to invest in the next generation invest in our children and to what's God multiply his blessing in our life because of it. It's really clear that Jesus understood this in Matthew 4. This is our final message where we're learning to to win the battle of becoming because when Jesus looked at Andrew and when Jesus looked at Peter, he said to them, come follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. In other words, can you imagine how inspired they had to be to have somebody who had the capacity of Jesus believe in them them to the degree he did and to say to them I will bring this capacity out of you if you'll just let me show you what you're capable of doing as a person and of course Jesus spent three years with them and the world was changed not just because of how Jesus ministered but because of how Jesus multiplied ministry in the people that he trained and that's what God was talking about to Abraham about we closed with this story last weekend where where Abraham had offered his son Isaac on the altar and when he did there was an angel that spoke from heaven two different times the first time the angel said don't lay your hand on your son to harm him sometimes leaders lay their hands on people and they harm their development and they do it because sometimes when we're young we don't live with the discipline and the determination that we should but we have to be careful we don't over discipline people whenever they're not doing everything 
everything right. And then God said to Abraham, because there's a ram who's caught in the thicket. And what he was saying to him is that God's grace, if they ever understand how to walk in grace like you did, I'm going to do some amazing things in their life. So make that your primary concentration. And then the second time that the angel spoke to Abraham, he said this, he said, this is what the Lord says, because you've obeyed me and you haven't withheld your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you and I'll multiply your descendants beyond numbers like the stars in the sky and like the sand on the seashore. Your descendants are going to conquer the cities of their enemies. Do you notice that it was because Abraham didn't withhold? In the Hebrew, it means he didn't keep people in the dark. He didn't, he wasn't too busy to hand things down. It was because of that that God said to Abraham, I'm going to multiply my blessing among your next generation. And you know, Abraham, those things that matter so deeply to you because the enemy's harming people and the enemy is making people's lives so miserable. He said, your children are going to do something about what the enemy is up to in the world. Now, fortunately in the Bible, we're given instruction on how to do this really well. And it's in an epistle that the apostle Paul wrote. And scholars say this is the last epistle the apostle Paul wrote before he was martyred. And he wrote to one of his three closest spiritual sons, perhaps the one who is the closest of all, Timothy. And he said in 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, Timothy, I want you to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And in two verses, Paul gives us the three secrets of how to pass on to the next generation what causes God to do a greater work in their life than what God even did through our life. And the first thing is we have to have an education. We have to know where we're we're going. How many of you know you can't take somebody where you haven't been any more than you can come back from somewhere you haven't been, right? And Paul starts with that and he says, Timothy, if you want to make a difference in the world like I know you do, it's going to start with how strong you are in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul had an amazing love and respect for the grace and the mercy of God. It's evident in all the epistles that he wrote. I'll read you just one of them in in 1 Timothy 15 and, and verse 16 of the first chapter he said this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Now how many of you know this was written in the first century and you've met some people who maybe that could be edited a little bit. Maybe there's somebody you met that maybe seems like a worse sinner but that wasn't what Paul's point was. Listen to what he said he said but for that reason he said, I was shown mercy. What a beautiful perspective that he says, I was the worst. In fact, I was a terrorist and God looked at me and he said, I want to have mercy on him and I don't want him to, to reap what he sowed. I don't want him to receive what he deserved because if I show mercy on him and if I bless him, a lot of people are going to be motivated about what I can do in their life. And then Paul wrote about the great of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10 and he said it's by the grace of God that I am what I am in another place he called it the all surpassing grace of God in other words you start having blessing in areas you couldn't have had it if it wasn't for how the word of God taught you to do things right in areas where life had gone wrong if it wasn't for how the Holy Spirit protected you gave you ideas that brought blessing into your life if it wasn't for how mentors in the church began to sow into you so that you become successful, that's what the grace of God begins to accomplish in our life. And I remember when I was 19 years old and I first started attending a Bible-believing church like this, that my pastor would tell us, now I want you to pray in the morning. And I want you to say, Father, you created the heavens and the earth. And Father, you've made the storehouses of heaven available to me because you care about my success. And I want you to know, Father, I am faithful and I am available to you today. And I can still remember doing that for my first time. And I was thinking, is this spiritual kookiness or is there really something to this that I need to experience? And I'm here to tell you this morning that 
that I wouldn't take anything from my journey now. I'll tell you, our God is good. And if it isn't good yet, listen, God's not done yet in your life. Can you say amen? See, the mercy and the grace of God can make such a huge difference in our life. Listen to what Jesus said to the people that he mentored in John 15, 7. He said, if you'll remain in me and if my words remain in you, you're going to start asking for what you wish and it's going to be done for you. That's what mentors can say to people. If you'll let my words mature you and if you'll let my words cause you to walk with God the way I have and then learn even more, I promise you mentoring is going to cause you to begin walking into the wishes of your heart now I've been very blessed in life to have some great mentors my dad was my first mentor and my dad was one of the most hard-working faithful good people who could build chemistry with people who were around him he had a highly successful career at PPG Industries in the research department and I know it was what my dad taught me about about being with people that has caused me to have a 35-year pastorate where people didn't want to get rid of me can say amen especially when I was young and the sermons weren't so good I can tell you my dad's mentorship made a huge difference and then pastor Billy Joe became my mentor in college and I knew when I was sitting there listening to his sermons that God was somehow preparing me for the things that God has asked me to do today and then of course Tamara's dad became my mentor and he taught me how to share the Bible in ways that it built great lives and he taught me how to lead a church so things are safe and things are successful and things are are pleasant within that church family and I know I wouldn't be who I am today if they didn't pay the price to be who they were in their lifetime and it's such a joy to me that I got to have my mentors come speak in our church and I'll never forget the first words Pastor Billy Joe said when he spoke to you of course he's up in heaven now but he looked at me and smiled and he said boy Jim he owes me his life he said because Tamara would have never married him the way I first met him can you say amen and we all laughed but he and I both knew he was serious that he sowed something into me that ended up changing my entire life and that's where it starts with mentorship it starts with education we have to say God take me somewhere I want to go somewhere maybe you're struggling in your marriage today and and you want to say God I want to go somewhere that doesn't just change my life it changes a whole lot of lives maybe your finances are out of control well I can tell you education will change that and you can go somewhere and you can literally see your whole family line change by what God does but then Paul said there's a second step to effective mentorship and that is we have to entrust to to the right people it's so insightful to me when he says Timothy be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus and then the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses I want you to entrust to reliable people so you notice he makes a differentiation here between many witnesses and faithful people and Paul taught many people but he entrusted what he knew to very few people and you say why did Paul do do that well it's because a lot of people don't have the determination a lot of people don't have the discipline a lot of people don't have the drive a lot of people don't have the grace to reproduce what God has reproduced in your life and so you have to be selective about who you entrust what God's given to you you have to be selective as you entrust that to other people we only have so much time and I've watched so many mentors who you know they come to the end of their life and one of the great blessings I had was I hosted all the guest speakers for Tamara's father when I worked for him and I would ask him all the same question I would say if you could go back and if there's anything you could do differently because you're highly successful obviously you've done so much right but if you could go back what would you do differently and I'll never forget a man who wept and he looked at me and he said if I could go back he said I would give much less time 
time to the people who demanded time of me and I would have sown into my spiritual sons better as a person. See, he was learning what God said to Abraham and that is it's not just going to happen. You're going to have to take time and maybe you're going to be tired because, you know, creating success takes some energy and sometimes people can get tired or maybe you're going to want to enjoy your success because you've worked so hard to have your success. But God says, no, let me tell you what's even better. Start sowing into some young people whenever you're young so that you see that blessing multiply throughout the world. I remember when Michael was 13, I coached a a select baseball team here in town. And the kids he played All-Stars with came to me and they said, Pastor Jim, they said, we want to play the big boys in Houston and in Austin, and we want to show them what we can do. And I said, that's awesome, guys. And then they looked at me and they said, we want you to be our coach. And I thought, I'm not sure that's awesome, guys. (laughs) But for six months, I was over here on this little baseball field, and I was pouring my heart into those kids. And you know what, y'all? They made it to the national tournament. Come on, somebody, right here from Victoria, Texas. But listen, they didn't start that way. They started 0-13 as a team. And I made a rule, and here was my rule. I said, if you miss practice this many times, you can't be part of the team anymore. And you say, well, man, that sounds a little bit hard. Well, you know, they made practice all except one kid that was one of my best players. He hit in the top of the lineup, and he came from a broken family. And I used to drive by his house and drive by his trailer, and I would bring him to practice with me. And sadly, I couldn't even keep him on the team doing that because he had uncles who wanted to take him drinking and who wanted to take him places that were destructive to his life. You say, Pastor Jim, why did you have that rule? Here's why. Because if I don't have reliability, I can't have victory down the road. It's only if you have reliability that God can start bringing victory into any single area of our lives. And that's why Paul said to Timothy, God wants to do so much in the world. I'm going to tell you, Timothy, how it happens. It happens with people hungry for God. Anybody in this church today hungry for God? Anybody here who knows Jesus? Jesus loves you and you don't have to stay in what sin has done to your life but he hung on that cross because he wants to reverse it in your life can you say amen it starts with education but then all around us are people that we can entrust our life to and and we can look for people with the discipline the desire that if I sow into them God's going to multiply what meant so much to my heart. I don't know if you ever heard the story about the farmer who was sitting on his porch and one day this young couple came driving by his house out in the middle of nowhere and he looked at this young couple as they came to the front porch and he said, what's wrong? And the wife said, well, my husband told me he knew where he was going and we ended up here. How many of you know that happens sometime? And then the husband frantically asked the farmer, he said, can you tell me if this road will get to the town where they lived and he said sure he said it'll get there you just need to know all the right turns to take if you're going to get there right and that's why mentors are so valuable in our life they teach us the right turns that we have to take if we're going to make it into the place that God's speaking to us about in our hearts and listen there may be a gap today between where you wish your health was and where your health is mentors can teach you what to do to live long and to live strong. There may be a gap in your relational life. You wish that relationships were more refreshing. You wish your marriage was more meaningful. Mentors can tell you the turns to take to get into what's got, got, what God's motivating you to do in your life. I want to share a story that probably moved me as much as any story that I heard in this last year. And it's a story a guy named Jim Cimbala told, who's the pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle Church in Brooklyn, which is part of New York City. And Jim has pastored that church for 50 years. He started with 40 members. He now has 15,000 members in that wonderful church. And I'll tell you a funny story about the story. In 2004, I wanted to learn how he led his prayer meetings on Tuesday night. So I flew into New York City to go to his Tuesday night prayer meeting, and I had pulled an address down off the internet, and I had the taxi driver take me to the place that they said the address.
waitress was. And when I got there, it was dark because it was a night service and there weren't any lights on in the building. And I thought, boy, this is strange. And then I got to the door and I read that the church had moved from that location and now they had bought a theater across the way. And I looked back and my taxi was gone. And I was surrounded by pimps and prostitutes and drug pushers and drug users. And I didn't see a taxi anywhere. Finally, a Brooklyn Tab member looked at me and he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, we better get you out of here. And I could tell his eyes were saying, Opie, this ain't Mayberry. Come on, I got I to gotta take you somewhere. And so he walked me to where the new building was. And can I tell you what blessed my heart so much? I walked in to that church and I saw people who had all the same scars as the people that were all around me on the street. But I saw people who had a smile on their face because God had redeemed their life. And I thought of the words that Prince of Preacher, E.V. Hill, used to say, if you want to build a great church, you love the people who are in the gutter most. And you, you show them how Jesus can take them to the uttermost and bless them beyond their wildest imagination. Amen? See, there's a special joy in handing down the blessing, and that's what Jim Cimbala did. And the story that so moved me was a story where he was preaching his third Sunday morning service, and on the third row, there was a man that had obviously been through a lot in life and was still in a very, very tough place. He said, when I closed the service, he said, this man approached me. And he said, I thought he was going to ask me for money because he was obviously addicted. And Jim has people in the church that when those people come, he has money that they take and they buy them a meal because you don't want them spending that money on alcohol and drugs. And so he was prepared to show this guy, somebody who'd take him to lunch, when the man looked at him and he said, no, you don't understand. I don't want your money. He said, what I need to know is, is this, what you preach this morning, can it really change a, a man's life like mine? Or are you just a good speaker? Can it really change my life? And Jim was so touched. He looked at him and he said, would you just keep coming for a year and watch what God does in your life? And he looked up as this man just kept coming to his church. And his heart got moved by the determination and the discipline that this man showed. Jim Cimbala started investing in him. He invited him to have dinner at his, with his family over the holidays. And he just kept investing and investing. And the church around him kept investing and investing. In. And you know what that guy's doing today? Listen, he, he is now the associate pastor of an awesome church in New Jersey because somebody passed it down. They didn't just hold on to it themselves. Amen? That's what we all have the opportunity to do because there are lost people all around us. And we all know something other people don't know. And can I tell you this? When you get to heaven, the richest people in heaven are going to be people who chose to pass it on instead of just hoard it to themselves. That's why the Apostle Paul said, we learn from Jesus that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's a lot of hard work to be successful, but let me tell you something. I don't want to live the rest of my life without passing on like Jim Cimbala what I know so that people all around me are blessed. So it begins with education. We have to know the way. Everybody say know the way. And then we have to entrust it to the right people because not everybody's going to go the way. Everybody say go the way. And then the final thing Paul said is that it's not done until we empower people. We have to show them the right way. He said entrust Timothy what I've shown to you to reliable people who are going to be qualified to teach others. In other words, don't stop, Timothy, until you see that these people have become qualified. Those people who are loyal, those people who are hardworking, those people who are disciplined, not people who quit on you in the middle and talk bad about you and do the things that some people are going to be tempted to do. But Timothy, just keep sowing into those special people in your life. And Timothy, you watch what God does in those people's lives. Can I say something I want you to think about this afternoon? Could it be that the reason that there are so many 
problems in our country today, even though there's so much great information and it's never been more available like it is on the internet, but could it be that the real problem is that people don't just need information, they need mentors in their life? Can I say something else? Could it be that the reason churches are in decline all across America is because people need more than information. They need mentors in their life if God is going to transform their life. I think Paul agrees with this because listen to what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 4.15. He said, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, he said, you only have one spiritual father. What he was saying is, you know what? People don't just need information. They need somebody in their life who's willing to nurture them until they become who God knows that they can become. And I want to close with this illustration. Do you know where we got the word coach from? There's this little town that's in Hungary. It's about 40 miles northwest of Budapest. And it was on the mail route. And they got a bright idea in that town one day. And they decided to make carriages that made carrying the mail easier. And these people were highly resourceful. They made the best carriages, and their carriages ended up selling all throughout Europe because their carriages were so great. Do you know what the name of that little town is? It's spelled K-O-C-S, but in Hungarian, it sounds like coach. So their carriages got called coaches, and that's what coaches do. Coaches are not just teachers. They don't just give you information, but coaches carry you from where you are to the place that you know in your heart God wants you to be. How many of y'all are ready to be that kind of church and you're ready to watch God carry people? Only his grace can carry them too, amen? Okay, would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and I, I told you I'd get you out of here by 1220, so we're gonna get this done here. But I want you to do this with me. I want you to say, Lord, thank you. You are the creator of heaven and earth. The storehouses of heaven are open over me. And Lord, I believe that if I abide in you and your words abide in me, I'm going to ask for what I wish and it's going to be done unto me. Now, if you have some wishes in your heart and you believe God's going to take you that direction this year because of His grace as you read the Bible, His grace as you pray, His grace as you let mentors sow into you this year. Would you give God a big hand clap of praise if you believe that? Amen. And now if we all could just bow our heads, close our eyes, we want to pray for some special people as we close the service. I know that, you know, for you to be in church this morning, if you're here and You say, well, man, pastor, my heart isn't where I wish it was. My heart isn't where I know it needs to be. But you're in church because you're open to God changing that. But here's what I want to help you understand because it'll mean so much in your life. That God doesn't change our life because we're open to change. God changes our life when we let his grace begin to show us better choices. It's why Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is gonna be saved. Whenever you let him start teaching you to make the right choices, to make the right turns, when you develop a daily relationship with the Lord who loves you more than you've ever been loved, who leads you better than you ever knew that you could be led, it's whenever you let him take charge that he blesses and changes your life. And if you're here today and you say, well, you know, Jim, I've never done that. I know God up in my head, but I don't know his love in my heart. I I don't know what it means to be led by him like that. We want to pray a, a prayer for you. And we believe today can be a special day, a new day, where God begins to do some beautiful things in your life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you, if that's you today, if you're ready to say, Lord, I want to live in your love. I want you to lead me. I'm going to count to three. Just lift your hand up at your seat on three so I know who I'm praying for. Okay, and then we'll pray. Are you ready? One, two, if it's time for God's love, three. Shoot up your hand all over this place. God bless you. 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 Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, ushers. God bless you. God bless you. 
Okay, one more question. Maybe you're hearing you say, well, Pastor, I served God at one time. And so I do know his love, but I've strayed. And today I want to get back on course. If that's you, would you lift your hand too? We want to pray with you as well. God bless you. God bless you and you and you. God bless you. So many of you. Anybody else? Right here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we can all look up. Let's put our hand on our heart. Let's pray with those who lifted their hands. Let's say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming from heaven down to earth so we'd know how loved we are and how great God's blessing can be on every life. Lord, today, I want to thank you for loving me when I wasn't living right and for wanting my best when I was doing bad. Today I receive your salvation with a grateful heart. Lord, help me grow to be who you see. And when I mess up, help me grow up instead of giving up. In your name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, can we give them all a great big hand clap? Amen. And before we go, we want to let all you who prayed know that, man, we're so excited for you. And we know that it's the, the church's role to sow things into your heart to cause God to bless you, to support you as you walk and become who God knows you can be. Uh, to help with that, we have a gift for you today. It's in the white packets at the exits on the table. Uh, there's a book in there to bless you and some cards that can be a big help teaching you how to walk with God and how to start making good friends. And can we all stand to our feet? I want to say also to those who prayed, we're going to put some instructions on the screen before I say this closing blessing. And uh, if you'll text, we'll make signing up to be baptized really simple. Everybody say this with me. Would you say believe and be baptized? You know, when we're baptized, that's the first time we have to say to Jesus, I'm serious about believing. And uh, how many of you know he blesses us in big ways? Amen? So here we go. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord uh, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. High five some people around you. Tell them how great it was to see him in God's house. Amen. <laughs>